Welcome to Normandy Christian Church Online. We're glad that you're here with us. Please let us know in the comments or message us if there's any way that we can be praying for you or any way that we can be serving you. Uh, we have a couple things going on during the week. Also, I want to let you know that we do have in-person service on Sundays at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. So if you're local in the Des Moines area, Des Moines, Washington, uh, if you're in the area, then 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. Identical services, but you'll be able to join in with some uh, worship and in, in music and it's the same message that we, we preach online is the same message that is preached in person. A couple of things that are going on during the week. Tuesday nights, we have a community group that we get together for Bible study and prayer and fellowship and snacks. And then Thursday nights, we have an online Bible study. So if you, if you can do Zoom, if you're uh, able to do that, 5.30 on Thursday. And we'll send you a link if you just let us know. Uh, just email me, kyle at normandychristian.org, and then we'll send you a link to that. A couple other events coming up. A big one is... May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, is going to be a night of prayer. We're encouraging the church to gather for an hour of prayer from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. So please come on out. We'll have a guided time of prayer, praying for our nation, our world, our families, our communities. And uh, we just really feel uh, this is important for us to be doing as a, as a church gathering. So please make that a priority to come out. And then we have a, a Christian camp that serves all ages and families during the summer months, particularly. There's other, other camps going on during the winter, but especially during the summer. And we want to get that camp ready for the summer programs if, if we're able to with, with COVID guidelines. Right now, we have a green light to do overnight camping. But if you can help us get the camp ready, we do a thing, we join in with other churches called Serve Camp, and we go out and just get the camp ready. We go and do some painting or hammering or getting trails ready, all kinds of fun things. It's a family thing. You can bring your family. There's no child care, so you got to watch your own kids, but uh, the, we'll house you there. We'll feed you. It's free, but not free. It's donation basis. If, if you can't afford anything, come if you can help out with a little bit and, and donate some, that's great too. But the big idea is uh, getting people together to uh, get our camp ready for the summer. And uh, so if you, can, if you can join us, that's Memorial Day weekend, May 28th through 31st. And it is offered during the whole weekend, but if you can only go like Saturday or Sunday or a couple days, then, then let us know. But you got to register at pleasantvalleycamp.org slash serve and go on there and register. All right, let's pray and we're going to get into our message this morning. God, thank you so much uh, for life in you, that you want a good life for us. God, thank you for rescuing us from uh, life without you. And God, I pray that as we get into your word, we'll understand how you're revealing yourself and how you're revealing your word to us. God, we pray for understanding. We pray that you would help us to follow uh, your way, your good way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you got your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be uh, just doing several verses today. And in this series, we're only going to do small chunks of Scripture. So Matthew 5, 17 through 20, we're in a series called The Good Life. We're going through Matthew chapters 5 through 7. It's called Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And we're looking at how Jesus describes life in his kingdom, how Jesus describes the life of a Christian, the life of someone who follows after him. And so far... Jesus has described, and when I say so far, from the beginning of chapter 5, uh, we've looked at the Christian's character with the Beatitudes, and then we looked last week at the influence that a Christian has in the world if they live out that character that Jesus describes. The Christian life should be different than the world. We should stand out as different in a good way, right? We should be showing what it's like to be living in the kingdom of God. And that, that different life isn't because we're better by any means. It's because we have Jesus living in us and Jesus living through us. Uh, 
So let's, let's start in on uh, chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The law and the prophets, what is he talking about there? So the law and the prophets is, is really known as the Old Testament. It was a, a common reference to the Old Testament. It's the Hebrew scriptures. It was the Bible that Jesus had. Uh, and that's Matthew through Malachi. Uh, the, but the, specifically the law, let's talk about the law first, also called the Torah, is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And we, when we hear the word law, we think of moral decrees, moral uh, laws for us to follow, which is true. The law includes moral laws for us to follow, but it's, it's much more than that. It's a story. It's a story. Uh, it's God's story of how he created us and how he wants relationship with us. And it's also, the law is also about the promises that God makes and that he's going to fulfill, that God always fulfills his promises. So we, we think about the first five books of the Bible, what's laid down, what's set out for us. Uh, God shows us that, that he's always existed. He's the creator and he's created everything else and he created everything good. And he created man and woman to have a relationship with him. He created us to be in his image. He created us in his image that we would represent him. As, as we uh, go throughout creation, we're going to represent the one who created us. But what we see is the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, didn't trust the word of God. They trusted the word of a serpent. And that serpent, we find out later, is, is the devil, is Satan. And they, they trusted that word instead of God's word. They disobeyed, and instead of following God as their king, they really tried to uh, be the king and queen of their own lives. And we've done that. We've all done that. We've sinned against God. We've, we've decided that we want to live our lives a certain way, and we want to be in control of our lives. But do you see how that works out in your own life? Do you see what happens when you try to be the boss of your own life, the king of your own life? It doesn't work out so well. And Adam and Eve, when they, they disobeyed God, they brought death into the world. They brought separation from God. All of creation has been tarnished because of, and, and the image of God has been tarnished. It's not lost, but it's tarnished in that sin has affected all of creation, including us. So that now we're all separated from God because of our sin and that we don't have fellowship with God and we need help. So, so God, this is all part of the law. So when the Jews would hear Jesus talk about the law, they would be thinking about all this, not just the moral code, but, but God's story. And, and a big part of God's story is that he didn't just leave us in our sin. He promised a Messiah. He promised someone who would come into the world to rescue us and to redeem us and bring us back into relationship with him. And he, do, he does this through choosing Abraham. There's a man named Abraham in the book of Genesis that God chooses to belong to himself and that would be the father of this, this nation that would belong to him. And this nation would stand out differently from the rest of, of the nations and they would follow God. They would show the rest of the nations what it's like to be God's people. And so he called Abraham and he called his family. Eventually that became the nation of Israel to, to follow him and to be a light to the nations. Well, that nation, that family, before they became a big nation, that family uh, was enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. That's, that's been all part of, of God's plan in this, is, is even as we, we try to follow after God, we don't do that perfectly, and, and God allows us, allows certain things to happen. Uh, he allowed the Israelites to be enslaved for 400 years, but he's going to work something beautifully out of this. And so what happened is, he uses Moses to deliver them in a powerful, powerful way, delivers uh, Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, into this promised land where they would be his people, where they would show the rest of the nations, they would live differently than the nations and live as a light amongst uh, those nations. 
So that's that's very very summarized idea of the law, what Jesus is talking about with the law. But then he also includes the prophets. He says, don't think I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. The prophets would be the rest of the Old Testament. And the prophets were there to remind God's people of how he wanted them to live and remind them of our, their identity as God's people, that they're to be different. And when they weren't following after God, which was all the time, which happens with us, he reminded them to turn and to, to repent and to turn from their sin and to return to God because God, only in God do we have life. And they, they promised that if, if they wouldn't obey God, if they didn't follow God, that God would uh, punish them and God would send them into exile, which he did. And he, he promised, though, the, the, the prophets promised, that again, that this Messiah was coming. So uh, Jesus said that he didn't come to abolish the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. He wasn't canceling them or doing away with the Old Testament. He came to fulfill the Old Testament. Jesus is saying that he came to bring the law and the prophets to their intended goal. He wasn't changing the meaning of God's law. So when Jesus comes in in the Sermon on the Mount, this is really important as he's going he's gonna to talk about uh, the law. He's going to talk about how we live out the law that he's not, he's not coming up with something new. He's, he's bringing up the original intention of God's laws. He's showing how the Old Testament really was all about pointing to him. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He fulfilled it by fulfilling prophecies that were given about him. He fulfilled it by showing the true meaning of the Old Testament, but also by showing that he was the intended goal of the law and the prophets. The Old Testament pointed to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Tim Keller uh, preached this uh, one time. I want to I share this with you. I've, I've shared this with you. You might have heard this before, but uh, this is Jesus is the true and better. He says, Jesus is the true and better Adam. And this is, this, is how, this is how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. He's the true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden and whose obedience is imputed, is given to us. Jesus is the true and better Abel who, though innocently slain, has blood that now cries out not for our condemnation but for acquittal. Jesus is the true and better Abraham who answered the call of God to leave the comfortable and the familiar and go into the void not knowing whither he went to create a new people of God. Jesus is the true and better Isaac who was not just offered up by his father on a mount but was truly sacrificed for us. When God said to Abraham, now I know you love me because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from me, now we can look at God taking his son up the mountain and sacrificing him and say, now we know that you love us because you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from us. Jesus is the true and better Jacob who wrestled and took the blow of justice we deserved. So we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace to wake us up and discipline us. Jesus is the true and better Joseph, who at the right hand of the king forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his new power to save him. Jesus is the true and better Moses, who stands in the gap between people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. Jesus is the new or is the true and better rock of Moses, who struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. Jesus is the true and better Job, who truly, the truly innocent sufferer, who then intercedes for and saves his stupid friends. Jesus is the true and better David, whose victory becomes his people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. Jesus is the true and better Esther, who didn't risk leaving an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate ultimate and heavenly one, who didn't just risk his life, but gave his life to save his people. 
Jesus is the true and better Jonah who was cast out into a storm so that we could be brought in. Jesus is the real rock of Moses, the real Passover lamb, innocent, perfect, helpless, slain, so the angel of death will pass over us. He's, he's the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, the true bread. The Bible's really not about you. It's about him. Don't you love that? So, so first of all, what Jesus is saying when he says, I came not to abolish, but to fulfill the, the law and the prophets, he's saying that the, the Bible isn't just a, a bunch of moral stories and rules, but it's all about him. It's all about him and how he came to redeem us. He's the sacrifice for our sins. He's the temple. He's, he's the, the God who is with us. He lives the perfect life to show us what it looks like to live the good life that God called us to live. Jesus not only forgives us, and that's a, that's a big part of why he came, but he not only forgives us, but he shows us how to live the good life, and he gives us the power to do that. So, so Jesus is the point. He's the intended point. He's the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Second, what Jesus is saying about the Bible is that the Bible is the word of God. Verse 18, it says, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. When Jesus says, truly I say to you, uh, he's saying what I'm about to say is really important. He's saying it's, it's the word amen. Uh, and he's starting, which means truly or verily. Um, we use it at the end of our prayers Amen. This is true. Uh, but he's starting his, his statement with amen. Truly, I say to you, not an iota, which the iota would be the smallest letter of, of the Hebrew alphabet, just like a little um, comma, or a dot, the very smallest stroke of a pen, will pass away. Not, neither will pass away from the law. Jesus is saying that the Hebrew scriptures are perfect. Nothing's going to change from them. Uh, they are God's truth that won't change. God's word is going to last longer than this present heavens and earth. So, so um, we can trust his word because it doesn't change. And Jesus isn't coming to change anything. He's coming to fulfill, coming not to abolish, but to fulfill God's word. Because Jesus has a high view of God's word, we should have a high view of God's word. Because he believes it's God's word, we should believe it's God's word. Jesus is saying, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Which is until uh, he brings in his kingdom fully. Until the new heavens and the new earth come. So, I want to ask you, are you going to trust, will you trust the word of God? Jesus does. Jesus says he trusts the Old Testament. It's the word of God. Nothing's going to change from it. Jesus knew the word. He quoted the word. Remember when he was tempted in the wilderness? He quoted the word of God. He lived the word. And then third, Jesus is saying that the Bible isn't just to be believed, but it's pointing you to Jesus so that you'll center your life around him and be changed by him. Verses 19 and 20. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The Bible isn't just trying to get you to be a better person, right? It isn't about, about man, I just need to try to get, be a better husband or a better father. Uh, that's, that's not what the Bible's all about. Um, we don't enjoy the good life by just trying to keep the rules, trying to keep the law. Jesus says that we do need to obey all the law. He, he's saying we need... There's, there's none of it you need to disregard. You need to obey all the law. 
However, remember that Jesus gives the full meaning of this. So like if we're going back to dietary laws in the Old Testament, um, we don't need to follow all those laws. Jesus uh, made all foods clean, as he says in, in the New Testament. He's, he's making all foods clean again. So remember, when we're looking at the Old Testament, Jesus brings the, the full intended meaning. He's fulfilling the law. But don't minimize any of his commands and te or teach others to minimize his commands. Then he goes on to say, not only do we not, should we not disregard any of, of his laws, but your righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. That would have been a shocking statement for his disciples because the scribes and the Pharisees had the most incredible record on keeping the, the rules of, of the law and looking righteous as they did it. Was, these were the most religious people of the day, more religious than you or me. They knew the scriptures. They tried to follow them the best they could and they wanted to keep the rules so bad that they even made rules so that they would keep the rules. Have you ever done that? It's like, don't want to, don't want to break this, so I'm going to put some guardrails up so that I don't, I don't even come close to, to breaking those. Which isn't, isn't bad, it's just they, that's what they thought made them righteous, is by making these rules and following all these rules, and then expecting other people to follow their rules. So not just God's laws, but even their rules that they made. That's called legalism. The, the scribes and Pharisees were legalistic. Some of you grew up in legalistic backgrounds where people taught a list of rules that you need to follow to get God's approval, that, that this would make you a better Christian if you follow these things. You need to, you know, it, it might have been... Um, you need to read a certain translation of the Bible, and that's the only translation you could use. Or you only listen to certain kind of music, or wear certain kind of clothes for Sunday, or there needs to be a certain political party or a way that you vote, and that's the only thing a Christian can do. The list goes on. That was the scribes and Pharisees. They were highly respected religious people, way more religious than any of us. They were rule followers, but they were more concerned with how they looked than what was going on in their hearts. Jesus confronted the scribes and Pharisees often. Here's a pretty um, sharp uh, rebuke that he had for the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23. He says, woe to you. Man, that's not a, that's not a great, great way to, to be addressed um, by Jesus. But he, he loves them, okay? He loves the scribes and Pharisees. He's warning them. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So he's saying, you look good on the outside, but on the inside, you're a mess. You're putting on a good show. Hypocrisy would be uh, the idea of putting on a mask. You, you look one way, but on, on, on the inside, you're not really that. John 5, G, another time where Jesus is addressing the scribes and Pharisees. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Jesus is again saying the scriptures are all about him. The Bible's all about him, that we don't have life just in, in these words or just even trying to follow these, these words. But we have life in Jesus because he's the one who fulfills all the Bible. Jesus is the point of the law and the rest of the Bible. See, you can love reading the Bible. You can have many Bibles. You can do a lot of highlighting and taking notes in your Bible or going to Bible college, all of those great things. But you can do all that and still miss the point. 
a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees is a righteousness that comes from a changed heart. It's not about rules divorced from a relationship with God. Just because you are religious doesn't mean you know Jesus. Stott, a preacher um, that uh, many people uh, go to for, for his commentaries, says this, It was a new heart righteousness which the prophets foresaw as one of the blessings of the messianic age. I will put my heart or I will put my law within them, and I will write it upon their hearts, God promised through Jeremiah. How would he do that? Ezekiel, he told Ezekiel, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. See, the good life that God calls us to is not only being forgiven of our sins, which is awesome, and that's a huge part of why he came, to be forgiven of our sins. That is amazing grace, but he's also called us to live an abundant life. He's called us to live a a thriving life, a good life, and that's with his spirit in us, that he doesn't call us to something that he doesn't equip us for. He calls us to live a righteous life and then he gives us all the tools, the Holy Spirit, to be able to do that. So you don't have to be, you're not a slave to sin anymore. If you're in Jesus Christ, you're not a slave to sin anymore. And you're not a slave to rule keeping. It's not about just a checklist you have to make. But what happens is when when God puts his spirit in you, he gives you a new heart, what happens is you get new desires. You want to follow God instead of feeling like you have to follow God that you want to do what he says. You want to live the good life he has for you instead of what you thought was the good life without him. He, also, he came to give you abundant life as his kingdom people, but as his kingdom people living here on this earth, salt and light to the world. God has called you to belong to him. Do you? Do you belong to him? You can right now. You can decide to give up ownership of your life to Jesus Christ. He's a way better owner and way better king of your life than you are. Believe in him. That's how you get God's approval. That's how you you have uh, God's uh, approval over your your life is for you to say, I believe in you, God. I'm not going to trust in myself anymore. I believe in you. It's not by rule keeping. If you do, if you believe in Jesus, you belong to him so that you can live the righteous life that he makes possible. And you're going to point others to the one that the Bible is all about, Jesus. So when we do Bible studies, either individually or as groups, we've got to always look at how does this point to Jesus? How does this show the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ? Not how can I be involved in rule keeping and legalism, but how, do, how does this make me follow after Jesus Christ? Throughout the next several weeks, um, as we go through Matthew chapter 5, uh, particularly chapter 5, we're going to hear Jesus say, you have heard it was said, and then he's going to say, you've heard it said, uh, do not kill or do not commit adultery. But then he's going to say, but I say to you, and what he's doing is he's not giving a new law. He's not, he's not saying the old law was wrong, the Old Testament is faulty. What he's doing is he's, he's putting his righteousness next to the scribes and Pharisees' righteousness and said, this is what you thought was righteousness, this is what you taught was righteousness, but this is what I say is righteousness. This is what I say is the good life, the way you are to live your life. What's awesome is that Jesus claims divine authority when he says it. He says, but when, he says when I, but I say to you, he's claiming deity. He's claiming to be not just human, but God. And as a community of Jesus followers at Normandy, and if you're, if you're part of another congregation and you're just watching in, where you are, that community of believers that you belong to, and I pray that you do plug into a community of believers, 
I pray that we'll all commit together, we'll commit to follow God wherever he takes us. Whatever he's calling us to do, whatever commands he gives us, that we're going to follow after him and to trust him and to trust that his word is true and that his word is good, that he's a good God and that he is God. And, and whatever he's calling us to, it, Jesus' commands are radical. We're going to see here in the Sermon on the Mount, it's like, this is not like what the world says the good life is. And it's even different than, I think a lot of times as Christians, we think the good life is. Jesus turns everything upside down. And he says, this is the life I've called you to. This is the good life. And it looks different than the world. But let's commit to this good life that Jesus is calling us to. Knowing that in this life, not everyone's going to like that lifestyle that we're living. Okay, not everyone's going to think that's all great. Uh, but many people will watch your life and our prayer and our words need to be um, that it would point all to God and how good he is and, and that they would glorify their father who is in heaven. Uh, also knowing that this good life is going to include some suffering. But when our king returns, fulfilling all the law and the prophets, we are going to enjoy eternal, abundant, good life with him in the new heavens and the new earth. As we prepare for a time of communion like we do each week, I want to bring up um, a passage from Hebrews 9 and, and how Jesus is seen as a fulfillment of the Old Testament. See, in the Old Testament, the, there was a, a way for sinful man to be near a holy God, and that way was through the temple and through the priests and through the sacrifices that sacri animal sacrifices were given in place of our lives because the wages of sin is death. The price of sin is death. And so God allowed these animals and... Uh, it's horrible, isn't it? Thinking about these innocent animals that were killed and it was because of our sin, but God used that as, as uh, instead of us uh, dying, that animals would be sacrificed and that priests would make those sacrifices for the people. The, the priests were the go-between between, between God and his, his, his people who were rebellious, right? And so there was this inner courts, this holy, holy of holies uh, court in the tabernacle and later the temple. And it was called the Holy of Holies. And in that Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. That was the very dwelling place of God on earth. That's where he chose to dwell among his people. But nobody can go in there. It was, if, if, if sinful people would have come into the presence of a holy God, they would die. And so God was protecting them with this holy of holies. He was protecting them with this big curtain. Uh, and only the high priest, one guy, could go into the holy of holies one time a year to make sacrifices, make atonement for the people's sins. And here's what the, the writer of Hebrews says. Here's, here's how Jesus fulfills the sacrifice and the priests in the temple. He says, when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, the tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood. You see what's going on here is Jesus now becomes the high priest who brings us to the Father. Jesus becomes the, he's the temple, he's the dwelling place of God. And now we see he's the very sacrifice. He becomes that final sacrifice that makes us acceptable to God. Securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled peoples with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. See, the Bible is all about Jesus. Our time of communion, and I, I encourage you, if you are believers in Jesus, to have this time of, of remembering his sacrifice on the cross, that this is the fulfillment 
He's the Passover lamb. He's the sacrifice for our sins. He's the high priest. He's the dwelling place that came to make his dwelling in us. Let's pray as we thank him for that sacrifice. And if you've never said yes to Jesus, if you don't belong to him yet, today's the day to belong to him. Please let us know that you're making that decision. We'd love to baptize you. We'd love to uh, walk with you and see you grow and, and um, walk with you in understanding God's word and understanding Jesus and his good life for you. Let's pray. God, thank you for... Uh, the good life that you've called us to. Thank you that you have fulfilled and are fulfilling uh, all of the Bible. That one day, Jesus, when you come again, you're going to bring everything back to your intended purpose. That all of creation is going to be glorified. All of creation is going to be made right again. And you're going to do away with sin and death and hell and Satan. God, we thank you for calling us to belong to you and enjoy the good life. God, I pray that as we go through this life and as we suffer and as we go through difficult times, God, that we'll never turn our backs on you, the good king who has only the good life for us. God, help us to remain faithful to you. Help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.